Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will be analysing important news appearing in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 24th September 2019. The topics to be discussed today are reflected on your screen and the timestamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's begin. Now this news appears on page number 11 and it reads inequality of another kind. Now in this article the author is trying to put forward a case as to why the right to internet access as well as digital literacy should be recognized as an independent right. Now this discussion of ours will become relevant from the perspective of GS paper 2 under the category of quality especially those concerning fundamental rights and the DPSP. Now the context of this article is that recently in the case of Fahima Shirin versus the state of Kerala, the Kerala High Court has declared that right to internet access is basically a fundamental right which is part of the right to privacy and education under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. Hence the court has recognized the right to internet access as being an implicit fundamental right which can be read into Article 21. Now let us first start with understanding what is the definition of digital literacy. Now the word literacy alone means reading and writing skills. However, when we add the word digital in front of literacy, it encompasses much, much more. Now given the new and the ever-changing ways with which we use technology to receive and communicate information, digital literacy means a broad range of skills, which includes everything from reading on a Kindle to calculating the validity of a website or or creating and sharing YouTube videos. Now the American Libraries Association defines digital literacy as the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create and communicate information which requires both cognitive and technical skills. Now remembering this definition is not important. I have just mentioned it so that you have an idea what, what exactly do we mean by digital literacy. So in a layman's term, digital literacy would mean an individual's ability to find, evaluate or compose clear information through writing and other mediums on digital platform. Hence, in digital literacy, digital platforms become the medium through which we are consuming and conveying information. Now, in this article, the author has laid emphasis on the growing digital inequality in India. Now, digital inequality or digital divide can be simply understood to mean uneven distribution in access to or use of information communication technology which will include access to internet, the ability to use internet, computer network, broadbands, etc. Everything which falls under the ICT. Now as for the author, digital inequality is actually growing because several of the government as well as private sector services have now become digital. That is, they are now available online. In fact, some of these services are only available online. And this has led to a new kind of inequality. In fact, according to Deloitte's report, Digital India Unlocking the Trillion Dollar Opportunity, in the mid-2016, the digital literacy in India was less than 10%. Hence, this low figure paints a very bleak picture as far as digital literacy in India is concerned. Because we can surely draw a contrast here. At one hand, where only less than 10% of the people are digitally literate, on the other hand, various essential services by the government and the private sector are now being provided online. So this variably means that for 90% of India's population, availing most of such services will be a Herculean task. Furthermore, this digital inequality actually increases the already existing socio-economic backwardness. Because information poverty, lack of digital literacy, as well as lack of digital infrastructure are all of the reasons because of which people are not able to access the digital services and the inability to access these digital services is further leading to increase in the socio-economic backwardness. Now considering the fact that we all are moving towards a global economy and in this global economy digital processes will transform the way in which people consume information, collaborate, work or even entertain themselves. And though providing people with services online does have a lot of advantage for the government, however, considering the fact that in India there is absence of digital literacy and internet access for most of the people, this absence will actually lead to the exclusion of a huge chunk of population and will further widen the already existing digital divide. Now coming to what are the issues related with digital literacy. 
Now the major issue involved is the economic cost. As per the author, the government's decision to make governance and delivery of services online without first making internet accessible or improving the digital literacy will actually lead to increase in the cost of the government expenditure. Let us understand this with the help of an example. You all must be knowing about the common service centers which have been established in the rural and the remote locations. Now these common service centers are basically physical centers which help in deliver digital government services as well as informing people about the government initiatives. However, creating such common service centers requires the government to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, manpower, etc. So though at one hand the government is trying to save resources by making services online, however at the same time the government now has to spend more in the way of these common service centers because the people are unable to access the digital government services. Now we have to understand one thing, that access to internet and digital literacy are both directly correlated. That is to say, there can be no digital literacy if people do not have access to internet. And furthermore, this access to internet in turn depends upon digital infrastructure. Because obviously, providing internet does require minimum digital infrastructure whether it is in the form of optical fiber network or in the form of broadbands etc. Till, till the time you do not have the requisite digital infrastructure, people will not get access to internet. And if people do not have access to internet, they will never become digitally literate. Now though the government has acknowledged this correlation and has also initiated certain measures in this regard, however all such measures are not enough. For example, the government has launched the Bharat Net program which aims to provide optical fiber network in all gram panchayats because it is this optical fiber network only which will act as an infrastructure backbone to the digital mission of India. However, this Bharat Net program has been continuously missing its deadline and at the same time the costs which are involved in its installation are increasing. Second initiative mentioned by the author is the National Digital Literacy Mission. Now here again, this mission has only touched just 1.67% of the population. And furthermore, it is also struggling with the lack of funds. Therefore, despite the fact that the government has taken certain initiatives, however, these initiatives are unable to bridge the gap of digital inequality. Next, moving on to what is the importance of digital literacy. Now, the Sustainable Development Goal, Target 4.4, speaks about increasing the share of the youth and the adults with relevant technical and vocational skills for a decent job. Here again, access to internet plays a very important role to improve the technical and vocational skills of the youth. Secondly, Indicator 4.2 asks the country to track the percentage of youth and adults who have achieved at least a minimum level of proficiency in the digital literacy. So basically, Target 4.2 speaks about tracking the people who are digitally literate. Thus, the mere fact that the digital literacy is included as a part of Sustainable Development Goals speaks about the importance of it. Moreover, according to the author, digital literacy will have much larger implication for the people beyond merely availing the digital services. Because as per the author, digital literacy will help people to navigate socio-cultural networks. As you all must be knowing, access to internet is just not to avail services of the government, but it also helps people to connect with one another, see what is happening all around the world, and basically help them to come out of their cocoon-like existence. So since people will be exposed to a new world, they will be in a better position to navigate their social and cultural networks. Now the basic point of the author in this article was that though Kerala High Court has acknowledged right to access of internet as a part of a fundamental right, however the author feels that what is required is that this right to internet access and digital literacy should be recognized as a separate right in itself and should not rather be read into Article 21. Furthermore, the author is stating what will be the benefits if we include digital literacy and right, and right to internet access as a separate right. Firstly, the moment we say that right to internet access and digital literacy is a separate right, it will create two obligations on the state. First will be in the form of a positive obligation where the state will be required to create digital infrastructure ensure a minimum standard and quality of the internet access and thirdly, it will help to improve the capacity building measures so as to increase the awareness amongst the people. On the other hand, this right will also create a negative obligation on the state 
where the state will have an obligation to not do anything which will impede, obstruct or violate this right. So all in all, it will make the state more responsible to actually take better steps in order to ensure that digital literacy penetrates till the last level. Secondly, recognizing it as a separate right will make it easier for the people to demand accountability from the state. Because now since it's a right, people can directly approach the court of law and ask as to why the state is doing or not doing anything in the, in the regard to digital literacy. Thirdly, it will nudge the legislature as well as the executive to actually take proactive steps in the direction of improving digital literacy in our country. And fourthly, the author says that this recognition as a separate right will also help to improve the implementation of certain directive principle of state policy, especially Article 38 Clause 2 and Article 39. Article 38 Clause 2 says that the state should strive to minimize various inequalities amongst people, which include inequalities of income, status, facilities, opportunities, etc. Article 39, on the other hand, gives certain principles of policies which have to be followed by the state while they are making certain kind of laws. And these include that men and women should have equal right to means of livelihood, equal pay for equal work, health and strength of the workers, not concentrating the wealth and means of production into certain people's hand, etc. Because now it has become a settled principle that fundamental rights have to be read along with directive principles so that the scope of the DPSPs can be enhanced and enlarged. And lastly, the author has concluded this article by stating that today we are living in an information society. And in this information society, having unequal access to internet actually increases the social divide amongst people and leads to larger social economic exclusions. Hence the time has come that we recognize right to internet access and digital literacy so that we can improve the situation and allow our citizens to an increased access to information services which in turn will create better opportunities for livelihood. Now based on our discussion of this article, please try and attempt this mains practice question. With this, let's move on to our next news. This news appears on page number 10 and it reads making the grand Indian PSV merger work. Now the context of the news is that recently the government of India has proposed to merge 10 public sector banks into 4 larger banks. Hence in this regard this article is raising concerns related to the mergers of the bank and accordingly is providing us with a set of recommendations to smoothen this process of bank mergers. Now this discussion of ours will become relevant from the perspective of GS paper 3 under the category of economy. Let us first begin with the risks and challenges. Now, if you have been following DNS regularly, you would know that we have spoken about the risks and challenges related to the mergers in length previously also. However, today again, we will be talking about the risks and challenges, but in a brief format so that you will be better able to correlate with the recommendations. Now, the first challenge is the systemic risk. It has been argued that a failure of a very large bank may have adverse impact on the economy as was witnessed during the financial crisis of 2008. The 2008 crisis highlighted that presence of a large financial institution poses a systemic risk to the economy because such institutions are too big to fail. Therefore, it is argued that a failure of a large bank will be too big to handle and in fact, if such an event occurs, the onus will then lie on the government who will have to come to the rescue of these public sector banks and bail them out thereby creating moral hazards. Because here we need to understand that most of the times the banks are at a slippery slope because of their own poor lending practices. Hence here it is also expected that if a bank continues with its poor lending practices, sooner or later it will run the risk of failing. And if such an event happens then the government will have to come and pitch in and this is wrong because why should the government bail out the banks because of their own poor performance and bad lending practices. Hence, it raises a moral question as well. Now, secondly, the merger of banks is usually undertaken to prevent the collapse of weak bank. However, in some instances, the poor balance sheet of the weak banks end up hurting the balance sheets of the stronger banks. And this in turn can lead to lower profit margins of the strong banks, which basically means that a merger of a weak bank with a strong bank can actually cause a slip or dip in the performance of the strong banks thereby lowering their profit and performance. 
The third challenge is with respect to the low positive correlation between the size of the bank and the efficiency with which they work. Now, usually the merger of PSBs is undertaken on an assumption that a large sized bank will be more efficient than a small sized bank. However, such positive correlation between size and efficiency is not always true. In fact, in case of India, it has been seen that certain small private sector banks have better efficiency and performance as compared to large public sector banks. Therefore, the assumption on which the mergers are actually being done is also a little flawed. The fourth challenge is related to the human resource integration. Now, obviously, if two banks are coming together, then human resource and manpower too will integrate. Therefore, human resource integration remains one of the most challenging problems which can hinder the consolidation process. Because many a times the employees will fear job loss and there will be a lot of disparities whether it is in the form of regional allegiances, benefits, reduced promotional avenues, new culture etc. Therefore all such disparity can hamper the process of human resource integration between the banks. The fifth challenge is with respect to low employment creation. Now the mergers of the banks will reduce the need to hire fresh employees and hence this in turn can aggravate the present unemployment situation in the Indian economy because now whatever jobs are being offered by the banks will now be removed from the market. The sixth issue is related to the credit creation by these banks. Now some of the economists have questioned the timing of the present merger because they feel now instead of focusing on credit creation to boost the present economic slowdown, these public sector banks will end up concentrating more on the formalities related to the merger and this in turn will end up hurting the economic growth in the near term which simply means that the PSBs will now be busy in the paperwork and other formalities related to the merger and will not focus much on credit creation which is actually the need of the hour because Indian economy is facing a slowdown. And the seventh and the last challenge is related to the disruption in customer retention. And now if you take the example of SBI's recent merger with its associate bank, we saw that a lot of customers of the associate banks decided to move their business to some other rival lenders because they did not feel the same amount of comfort to bank with the larger parent bank. Hence, customer retention will become another challenge. So these are the major challenges. Let us now talk about the recommendations given by the author. Next, let us talk about what are the recommendations given by the author to smoothen this process of bank merger. The first recommendation is to focus on a strong leadership. Now, the merger of banks would require a strong leadership at the top, accompanied by integration of technology and human resources. Because we need to have such people at the top level who are able to focus on integration planning, revamping the human resource, as well as culturally integrating the expanded workforce. Hence, in this regard, it is felt that the heads of the banks should be given a security of tenure for at least three years so as to avoid any kind of uncertainty in managing the merger process. Second recommendation is to strengthen the human resource. Now the public sector banks are under equipped in key areas of technology, human resource management and risk management. Therefore there is a need to recruit professionals from the market who can improve the competitiveness and the efficacies of the PSPs by better managing the human resource and risks. Thirdly, we have to focus on service delivery. The PSBs should ensure that they do not face shortage of the frontline staff, which can then compromise with the service delivery. Moreover, these frontline staff should be provided with the necessary training and capacity building so as to improve the effectiveness of the service delivery. Thirdly, we need to focus on credit creation by the NBFCs. Now, as we were talking earlier, the merger of the banks may lead to slowdown in the credit creation in the short term. However, this slowdown has to be offset by enhancing the credit creations by the NBFCs. Now, as you must be knowing, in the union budget of 2019, the government announced the credit guarantee scheme for the purchase of highly rated assets of the NBFCs and the HFCs. HFC stands for housing finance companies. Now, under this scheme, the public sector banks will purchase highly rated assets from the NBFCs amounting to a total of 1 lakh crores in order to address the temporary liquidity crunch. And moreover, under the scheme, the government has agreed to provide 
10% of the losses suffered by these PSPs. Now in this article the author is saying presently this credit guarantee scheme is available for only top tier NBFCs. However, such facilities should now be extended to all the NBFCs and not just the top rated one. Now the information about the credit guarantee scheme has been provided for in the PDF. But just remember that under this scheme, public sector banks will purchase highly rated assets of the NBFCs and the government of India will bear 10% of the total losses which are suffered by these PSPs. The fifth suggestion is related to the fourth one, wherein we have a credit guarantee fund trust even for the MSME sector which is managed by SIDB. Now the author is stating that even this credit guarantee fund should be should be revamped in order to assist more of the NBFCs. So here also funds will be even bought by the credit guarantee fund trust. Last but not the least is to carry out certain banking reforms. Now the author says that the government should consider the recommendation made by the Narsimhan committee wherein it stated that certain weak banks should be converted into regional banks. For example, Bank of Maharashtra has a high regional concentration and hence in turn could be turned into a very vibrant regional bank to serve agriculture, trade and commerce. So rather than just merging a weak bank with a strong bank, we can actually try and convert them into regional banks so that they can better serve the demands of that particular region, especially related to agriculture, commerce, trade, etc. So these were the basic recommendations. Now please try and attempt this mains practice question based on our discussion. With this, let's move on to our next news. Now this news appears on page number one and it reads, Renewable energy target to be more than doubled. Now recently, Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the United Nations Climate Action Summit has said that, that India is going to increase its renewable energy target. Now this discussion of ours will become relevant from the perspective of environment, especially in the context of prelims and can also be written as a point whenever a question on renewable energy is asked. So before we discuss what was the announcement made by the Prime Minister, let us first understand what are the renewable energy targets of India. Now the earliest guideline for a national renewable energy target was outlined in the National Action Plan on Climate Change in 2008. Now this National Action Plan on Climate Change recommended that India should get 50% of its energy requirement from renewable energy by the year 2020. Then in the year 2015, the government made an announcement that the national renewable capacity target of India will be set at 175 gigawatt by 2022. Now out of this 175, 100 gigawatt was to come from solar, 60 gigawatt from wind, 10 gigawatt from biopower and 5 gigawatt from small hydropower. So from the perspective of prelims, please remember these figures. Now this 175 gigawatt of renewable energy target is also noted as India's intended nationally determined contribution as a part of the UNFCCC, that is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The official pledge of India under the INDCs include the effort to reduce the carbon emissions intensity of the country's GDP by 33 to 35 percent by 2030 from the 2005 level. Which basically means that whatever was India's carbon emission in the year 2005, of that carbon emission, India will reduce almost 33 to 35 percent by the year 2030. Furthermore, the second INDC of India is to achieve 40 percent cumulative electric power install capacity from non-fossil fuel based energy resources by the year 2030. That means whatever electricity we are generating, out of that electricity, 40 percent has to come from non-fossil or renewable sources of energy. And lastly, you should know that renewable energy as well as energy efficiency are also part of India's commitment towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals from the period of 2016 to 2030. So in this discussion, what is of importance is to remember this 175 gigawatt target of India by 2022 as well as what are the intended nationally determined contribution of India. Now, Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the United Nations Climate Action Summit has said that India's renewable energy target will now be increased to 450 gigawatt. However, please remember it is just an announcement made by the PM and no official document in this regard has been released. Moreover, Prime Minister Narendra Modi also stated that India will spend approximately 50 billion dollars 
in the coming few years on the Jal Jeevan mission to conserve water, harvest rainwater as well as develop water resources. So these are the two announcements with respect to renewable energy. That is, we are likely to increase our renewable energy target to 450 gigawatt and that we will invest almost $50 billion on the Jal Jeevan mission. Lastly, in addition to speaking about the Zunir target, Prime Minister Narendra Modi also announced two international initiatives for India. Firstly, India, Sweden and other countries are going to create a platform both for the government as well as the private sector wherein they can come together and work to develop low carbon pathway for industries. Secondly, Prime Minister Narendra Modi also spoke about a coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. Now, this coalition was approved by the Union Cabinet last month only and almost 480 crore rupees have been allocated for its technical assistance. Now, various countries like the UK, Australia, as well as countries like Fiji and Maldives are going to be part of this coalition. Now, this Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure or the CDRI is basically an international partnership which will support countries, both developed as well as developing countries, to build climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. Now this coalition secretariat is based in Delhi and is supported by the UNDRR. UNDRR stands for United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And this coalition will build climate and disaster resilient infrastructure by facilitating knowledge exchange, providing technical support as well as by supporting capacity building. So these were the other two initiatives which were announced by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. With this, let's move on to our next news. Now this news has been taken from page number 8 and it reads, Survey of Dragonflies hints at impact of floods. Now this discussion of ours will become relevant from the perspective of GS Paper 3 under the category of environment as well as also from the perspective of prelates. Now the context of the news is that recently a survey of various dragonflies and damselflies were held at the Silent Valley National Park in Kerala and this survey led to the discovery of eight new species. However, at the same time, the survey found out that overall there was an alarming decrease in the population of the odonate. Odonate usually means a dragonfly or a damselfly. Out of the various dragonfly species, a very important one, namely the global wanderer, was missing from the national park. Now, the reason for the decrease in population has been attributed to the floods. Now, the aberrant rainfall in Kerala and the successive floods can be a possible reason for the decrease in their population because odonates or the dragonflies spend much of their lifetime as eggs and larvae underwater. Therefore, there is a high possibility that the floods could have actually washed them off. Now, the odonates carry a lot of ecological value. Firstly, is because they act as biological indicators and studying the odonates can actually give us information on the health of the aquatic habitats as well as the variations which occur in the climate because these odonates are very sensitive to climate change. Secondly, these odonates are very good pest controllers. In fact, dragonflies and damselflies have been used to reduce the diseases spread by other flies such as mosquitoes, horse flies, deer flies, etc. And these mosquitoes, horse flies are associated with diseases like malaria, yellow, yellow fever, dog heartworms, anthrax, tularemia, etc. So in all those places where these mosquitoes and other flies are infested, dragonflies are released in that place because they prey on such mosquitoes and other flies. However, at the same time, what is to be noted is that these dragonflies are voracious eaters. So though they might benefit us, by eating mosquitoes and other kind of horseflies and deer's fly. However, they can also eat other species which are actually beneficial for the ecosystem. Hence, the indiscriminate increase in the population of the dragonfly is also not good for the ecology. Let us now know a few details about the Silent Valley National Park. Now, the Silent Valley National Park is located in the northeast corner of the Palakkar district in the state of Kerala and was named as a national park in 1984. As you will see in this map here, right here is the Silent Valley National Park. So please remember that it is located in the state of Kerala. Mythologically, Silent Valley is also known as Asairandhrivanam as it was considered that this was the place where Sairandhri hid along with the five husbands, that is the Pandavas, 
while escaping the Kauravas. Now Sarendri was basically Draupadi and Draupadi had donned this identity when she was hiding along with the Pandavas from the Kauravas. Furthermore, the Kunthipusa river which flows through this national park has been named after Kunthi who was the mother of the Pandavas. Now this Silent Valley National Park in the north is shielded by the in the north is shielded by the Nilgiri Plateau and in the south it is covered by the Manarkad Plains. Now this Silent Valley National Park is the centerpiece of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves and this Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve has been declared as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in the year 2012. Now as far as the animals which are found in this park, the major animals are elephant, lion-tailed macaque, tiger, leopard, wild boar, panther, Indian Siver, Sambhar, etc. So here please remember that it's located in the state of Kerala and is a part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. With this, let's move on to our next news. Now this news appears on page number 1 and it reads, Shah moots one card for all utilities. Now recently, Union Home Minister Amit Shah has proposed the idea of a common utility card which will have all the utilities like Aadhaar, Passport, Driving Licence and Bank Accounts linked to it. He further said, though currently there is no formal proposal for the common utility card, however the digital census has the potential to prepare the database for it. Moreover, he also said that along with the census, efforts will be made to update the National Population Register. Hence, in this regard today, we will be speaking about what is the National Population Register. And this discussion of ours will become relevant from the perspective of GS Paper 2 under the category of Quality. Now, the National Population Register or the NPR is basically a very comprehensive identity database which is maintained by the Registrar General and the Census Commissioner of India under the Ministry of Home Affairs. So, please remember that the NPR is an initiative of the Ministry of Home Affairs and comes under the Registrar General and the Census Commissioner of India. However, please note that the NPR is different from the census exercise. Now, this NPR is basically a register of all the usual residents of India. So the term you need to remember here is the usual residence. What is a usual residence? We'll discuss that later. Now this NPR is being prepared at the local, that is the village level, at the sub-district, at the district, state, as well as at the national level. And this NPR basically draws its legality from the Citizenship Act of 1955, as well as the Citizenship Registration of Citizens and Issue of National Identity Card Rules of 2003. So here again, remember which act does this NPR come under. Furthermore, this NPR database will contain both the demographic as well as the biometric details of the usual residents of this country. Now moving ahead, as for the provisions of an NPR, a usual resident of this country will be issued a Resident Identity Card or an RIC. And this RIC will be issued to everybody who is above the age of 18. Furthermore, this Resident Identity Card will be a chip embedded smart card which will contain the demographic and the biometric attributes of each individual. Moreover, the unique identification number will also be printed on this card. However, here please note that this NPR is again is different from the NRC or the National Register of Citizens. Now the objective of the NPR is basically to create a comprehensive identity database for every usual residence in the country. Now as far as the historical background of the NPR is concerned, the NPR project goes back to the Kargil days because obviously at that time we had nothing like Aadhaar. So after the Kargil war, a committee headed by late K. Subramanyam recommended that there is a need to have color-coded identity cards for the citizens as well as for the non-citizens. So basically at that point of time, the aim of the NPR was to distinguish between citizens and the non-citizens. Now though Rajasthan was the first state to attempt issuing ID cards for citizens, however at that time there was no enabling legal framework, hence this initiative could not be taken forward. As stated earlier, the NPR is legally grounded in the provisions in the Citizenship Act of 1955. Now this Citizenship Act of 1955 was amended in the year 2004 and a new section namely section 14a was inserted. Therefore please remember the section number of the Citizenship Act which provides for such NPR. Now this section 14a stated that the central government of India may compulsarily 
register every citizen of India and issue a national identity card to them. Furthermore, the central government may also maintain a national register of Indian citizens and for that purpose establish a national registration authority. Hence, it is section 14A of the Citizenship Act of 1955 which gives the power to the central government to compulsarily register every citizen of India and issue them with a national identity card. Hence, from this section, it can be inferred that it is mandatory for every usual resident in India to register in the NPR as per section 14A of the Citizenship Act. Now, for the purpose of NPR, a usual residence is defined as a person who has resided in a local area for the past six months or more or a person who intends to reside in that area for the next six months or more. So these are the basic about NPR. And as far as the common utility card is concerned, we will speak about it when actually something concrete comes on it. Because right now there is no formal proposal for it. It was just a statement made by the Union Home Minister. But what was important for your examination point of view was to know about this National Population Register. And this NPR can be asked both in the prelims as well as in the mains. Now this news appears on page number 10 and reads credibility deficit. And in this article the author is saying that the recent episode where the collegium modified its recommendation with respect to Justice Qureshi has again brought to light the inefficiencies and opaqueness of the collegium system. Now we have spoken about the collegium system in detail in the DNS dated 15th September 2019. You can refer to this DNS for more information on this topic. With this let's move on to our next news. Now this news appears on page number 10 and it reads climate justice through judicial dicta. Now this editorial is in context with the recent judgment of the Supreme Court where it asked for the demolition of five apartment complexes in the Arunakulam district in Kerala. Now this entire issue as well as what are the coastal regulation zones, the history of the CRZ as well as other related information has been covered comprehensively in the DNS dated 27th July 2019. You can refer to this DNS for more information on this topic. With this, let's move on to our practice questions. Based on today's discussion, please try and attempt this mains practice question. We'll discuss the answer after 5 seconds. Question number 1 reads, consider the following statements about India's intended nationally determined contribution under the UNFCCC. The first statement, achieve 40% cumulative electric power installed from non-fossil fuels. Now this is correct. Second, reduce emission intensity to India's GDP by 33 to 35% 35 by 2030 from the 2005 levels. This is also correct. Hence the right answer becomes C, both 1 and 2. Question number two is with respect to the Silent Valley National Park. First statement, which is located in Tamil Nadu. This is incorrect. It is located in the state of Kerala. Second, River Kunthi crosses through it. This is correct. So the right answer becomes B, two only. Question number three is with respect to the National Population Register. First statement, it is legally grounded in the Census Act 1948. This is incorrect. It is legally grounded in the, in the Citizenship Act of 1955, especially Section 14A. Second statement includes both biometric and demographic details of the resident. This is correct. So the right answer becomes B to only. Question number four reads, which of the following renewable energy source currently has the highest installed capacity in India? Now the right answer is B, wind power and not solar power. Solar power comes on the second number. With this, we come to an end for today's discussion. Let's move to the question for the day.